This is Danny Shapiro, host of Family Secrets. Welcome to our fourth season. Family Secrets. It seems just about every family has them. Some secrets are kind of small and insignificant, and some are shocking and massive. When they come out, our new knowledge has the power to change our lives. Join me and our millions of listeners as we dive deep into the stories of this new season's amazing guests. Listen and subscribe on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Welcome to Stuff to Blow Your Mind, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, welcome to Stuff to Blow Your Mind. My name is Robert Lamb. And I'm Joe McCormick, and today we're going to be talking about nuclear weapons testing. Now, this is something that has come up on the show a good bit before. Obviously, we've had to talk many times about the the very real, uh, you know, danger, potential civilization level threat, and and the real human costs of nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons testing. But today I wanted to focus on a couple of interesting and lesser known environmental effects of nuclear weapons testing, uh, specifically something that I came across as it pertains to industrial metals. And then uh, we're going to get into some other scientific territory as we go on. But quite apart from any just straightforward chemical effects on the atmosphere, I think it is pretty fair to say that the the uh, the human departure into the nuclear weapons testing era in 1945 was really sort of a a shift moment for for humankind as a species. Yeah, and I and I feel like there there are very few things that have been said. There there are very few audio samples certainly that sum it up quite as well or or as, or are as haunting as those given by J. Robert Oppenheimer in uh, 1965 on the television documentary The Decision to Drop the Bomb broadcast as an NBC white paper. Uh, I, I imagine most of you have heard this before. I've heard it's uh, sampled and used in music. It, uh, it, it shows up in comic books, literature. Um, in it, the American theoretical uh, physicist and father of the atomic bomb, as he's sometimes uh, referred, uh, shares the following regarding the first successful detonation of an atomic bomb at the Trinity test in New Mexico on July 16th, 1945. Uh, he, he said, quote, we knew the world would not be the same. A few people laughed. A few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. It's a difficult thing to imagine working on that kind of research in a way feeling that it is your duty or your necessity to aid the allied cause in World War II. Uh, but at the same time, knowing that you are working on something that, that would unleash an age of terror in human history. Yeah, I mean, ab absolutely. A, a weapon that would, as of this recording, uh, has only been used twice in war, which uh, on one hand you can, you can say thankfully has only been used twice in war, but on the, on the same hand you can say tragically has been used twice in war. Um, yeah, and we'll we'll get into the um, just the destructive capabilities a bit of, of of the bomb as we proceed here, and of course we've covered it on the show before uh, to varying degrees. But I want to come back to the, the quote that um, that Oppenheimer is um, is deploying here. So if if you're not familiar with it, basically uh, these are these are who the, the figures are in this. You've got Vishnu, uh, mm -hmm. one of the principal deities of Hinduism. Mm -hmm. uh, the the Bhagavad Gita uh, or the Gita, as it's sometimes just shortened to, is part of the Hindu epic, the Mahabharata. Uh, technically, it's book six in that. And the prince in question is the hero Arjuna, uh, part of the uh, Pandava family that wages war against the Kauravas. Uh, that's the, the big struggle that's uh, that's key to the Mahabharata. Anyway, at the beginning of the Gita, uh, which Oppenheimer is um, is quoting here, Arjuna rides his chariot onto the field of forthcoming battle between these two families. But he's suddenly overcome by doubt and depression as he notes there, there on the other side, within the ranks of the enemy, he, he recognizes friends, relatives, teachers, and uh, and therefore has this this just immense uh, weight descend upon him. Um, 
This is a, a quote from it. This is as translated by Edwin Arnold in 1885. And as, as is always the case with translated works of uh, literature and poetry, uh, you know, the, the English is going to be approximate. And uh, certainly with Hinduism, there are many cases where particular ideas and phrases don't really have a, a parallel word in, in English. Um, anyway, it goes as follows, quote, Thus, if we slay kinsfolk and friends for love of earthly power, avat, what an evil fault it were. Better I deem it if my kinsmen strike to face them weaponless and bear my breast to shaft and spear, then answer blow with blow. So speaking in the face of those two hosts, Arjuna sank upon his chariot seat and let fall bow and arrows sick at heart. So the prospect of the forthcoming bloodshed is just too much for him. But what does he do? He turns to his charioteer uh, for counsel. And luckily, uh, his charioteer is the blue-skinned Krishna, the avatar of the mighty Vishnu. And he gives him his counsel. In fact, he gives him his counsel for 18 chapters. Uh, That's uh, that's what the the Gita is, is basically him providing all of this uh, philosophical and spiritual advice on what it is to have to make these sorts of decisions and engage in war and duty and so forth. This is kind of like uh, something like the Book of Job in the form we have it now, which you have a sort of small frame narrative that mainly contains a didactic discourse on on theological matters right now if you want to like a really good breakdown of this episode uh in the mahabharata of the gita as, and especially as it relates to oppenheimer in his life there's a, a wonderful paper that uh, you can find out there in full on the on the internet from james a hajia professor of history university of massachusetts dartmouth uh, he it, this was a nice write-up he did for the american uh, philosophical society in 2000 and he, he goes into greater depth but he also summarizes krishna's counsel as follows He's, he says, look, you're a soldier, Arjuna, you have to fight. Fighting is your duty, so you need to do it. Um, he also says, look, Krishna, uh, you know, th- this, this God, who I also am, is going to be the one to determine who lives and who dies. It's not your place to mourn or rejoice over uh, human uh, loss in this case. You should try to remain unattached from the outcome. And then also, faith in Krishna is going to be what saves your soul, Arjuna, and this is the most important uh, part of the whole scenario. But as Arjuna begins to metaphorically see the light, um, or I suppose behold the true nature of the reality he's faced with, he asks if he can see Krishna's godlike form. And this sight ultimately seals Arjuna's commitment to do his duty. And this occurs in chapter 11, verse 32, where, uh, uh, where the now cosmically embodied Vishnu uh, speaks to Arjuna. And it, what he exactly says uh, to English-speaking uh, uh, ears is going to depend on the translation. But, for instance, the writer translation has him say, Death am I, and my present task destruction. Um, there's a translation by Arnold that says, Thou seest me as time who kills, time who brings all to doom, the slayer time, ancient of days, come hither to consume. And there's another one I came across that uh, I thought was pretty good. I am mighty time, the source of destruction that comes forth to annihilate the worlds. And I've always loved this one by uh, J.A.B. Van uh, Bettinen, quote, I am time grown old to destroy the world embarked on the course of world annihilation. I am time grown old. I always find that kind of, uh, there's something kind of perplexing about that phrasing that seems befitting of this all-powerful being that is, you know, that has taken on his true form to you. Yeah, it's something that comes in the fullness of time. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting the way the the personification as time uh, further serves that purpose of the kind of depersonalization yeah. of, of one's role in history. You know, the, the, there is a kind of like... Uh, Uh, a fate or world path that is executed through the passing of time. And what you are is someone who plays a role within it, not the shaper of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Again, it is, it is even in translation as it's, it's this really uh, perplexing and beautiful passage. Now, uh, we should stress that Oppenheimer was not religiously Hindu, uh, but he was interested in Hindu scripture, and clearly he found an association here between his role in the creation of the bomb and the idea of duty performed regardless of potential outcome. Now, 
he certainly is bending the text here a bit because in in the Gita, Vishnu slash Krishna is saying, look, I'm the prime mover here. I'm the one who destroys. You just do your duty. Oppenheimer seems to be implying the opposite, that there perhaps is no all powerful force that bears the burden of our deeds, that the burden is instead on the shoulders of those involved in the creation of such a weapon. You know, when he's saying, you know, now I am become death and that we all felt that way one way way or another. I mean, I mean, he is he is. He seems he's confronting the personal responsibility that seems to be there in the creation of such a weapon. But so it does seem that there's this this double terror in Oppenheimer's mind, like what if we fail, but also what if we succeed? Yeah, yeah, the, that and that's something that uh, Hygieia gets into. You know, this this idea that there's this immense fear of failure. You know, what if we don't develop the bomb as we've been tasked with, uh, and what will that mean for us? But then. Yeah, well, how much mass human death will be brought into the world, even on the short term, uh, if this is successful, without even getting into the way that it will change the landscape of, of not only um, warfare and, and potential warfare uh, in global security, but just human civilization itself. Yeah, there's so many ways you can track the impact of the invention of nuclear weapons. Uh, clearly, one of them is a sort of like world psychological impact. You know, there's just there's bomb consciousness in the world now that that, that sort of will always be there unless uh, nuclear weapons are entirely eliminated. But even even then, they would there would probably still be the knowledge that they could be built again. Yeah, this this reminds me of one of uh, Grant Morrison's creations for the uh, the Doom Patrol comic book, the idea of the candle maker, this embodiment of all of our apprehension uh, surrounding nuclear annihilation that takes on this kind of godlike, really almost kind of terrifying Vishnu like appearance in the human psyche. Is this the guy who's made of wax? It is, and we'll have we'll have more to say about him in a forthcoming. October episode of Stuff to Blow Your Mind. Oh, that's right. It's almost October. It is. But uh, to, to come back to the part of Oppenheimer's quote that is not part of on the of the Gita, um, we knew the world would not be the same, uh, and, and that that is true. Uh, it wasn't. It isn't. And you're you're probably aware of most of the reasons why. But but yeah, in today's episode, we're going to look at some of the particular ways that it was changed, uh, particularly regarding. Um, you know, a few uh, environmental scenarios, as well as the nature of steel. Yes. Uh, so getting into these lesser known environmental effects, I, I want to start with the fact that might seem extremely odd, which I was reading about in an article published in the journal Health Physics in 2007 by a health physicist named Timothy P. Lynch. And the article is called A Historically Significant Shield for In Vivo Measurements. And the fact goes like this. In Richland, Washington, there is a research facility called the In Vivo Radiobioassay and Research Facility. And within this facility, there is a special room that is surrounded on all sides by thick plates of steel that was once part of a World War II era battleship called the USS Indiana. This was a battleship that served in the war. It was launched in 1941. Uh, it was in a number of battles. Uh, it served extensively in the Pacific Theater during the war. And then after it was decommissioned, they took steel out of the ship to build this room. Why would anybody do that? Yeah, it, 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 if you don't know the answer, it sounds a bit mysterious, right? It all it sounds like the kind of thing Grant Morrison would make up, where you're having to engage in some sort of magical uh, ritual involving steel from old ships. Oh yeah, yeah, it totally sounds like something magical. You know, the kind of magical or symbolic thinking of like, you know, I'm gonna melt down the statue of the golden calf for the false idol or king mm -hmm. or whatever, and and turn it into something holy. I'm gonna uh, make a throne out of all the swords of those who once opposed my rule. Yeah. Exactly. Yes, it is the Iron Throne. Uh, so this is the the Iron Throne of rooms. Now uh, the room is again an in vivo radio bioassay detector. And Lynch tells us in the paper that, quote, the detection system is used to monitor workers for intakes of fission and activation products. So this means that it's used to check workers, people, to see if they have ingested tiny radioactive particles known as radionuclides. 
Radionuclides consist of atoms that can decay into different isotopes and emit radiation as they do so. And if you take them into your body, say by swallowing them or breathing them in, they can do this inside your body and provide internal radiation sources, which you do not want. They can pose a serious health risk uh, if enough of them accumulate in the body. A large dose could cause acute radiation syndrome. Prolonged exposure to even smaller doses over time could be a risk for damaging DNA and causing cancer. This is, to use one example, why you don't want to consume things that would come from a radioactively contaminated area, you know, somewhere around a nuclear meltdown. Why would you not want to say, you know, roll around in the dirt near Chernobyl or drink the water there? It's because the the environment is contaminated with radionuclides, these little particles that you don't want anywhere near your body. You do not want them going inside you. So people who get tested regularly in this room would include Department of Energy workers, but Lynch also mentions that the room has been used to test a helicopter pilot and some other workers from Chernobyl, uh, as well as children from Chernobyl, I guess, who, who lived nearby. So this has been in use for a long time, and, it, and it's used to measure the radiation coming from living people. So somebody walks into the detector room, they get scanned for radionuclides across the length of the body by a counting system that Lynch describes as comprised of five coaxial germanium detectors. Uh, and because the level of radiation emitted by these radionuclides is usually very faint outside the body, you need an extremely sensitive detector. And here you hit another problem, which is interference from background levels of radiation coming from the rest of the world. So you've got cosmic sources, uh, atmospheric sources, terrestrial sources. So in order to scan the body properly, you need a room with extremely tight radiation shielding. And this is where the steel comes in. So the counting chamber here is surrounded by a thin layer of lead and then cadmium and then copper. Uh, this is what's known together as a graded Z shield. And then outside that, you have 30 solid centimeters of steel that's all pre-war battleship steel. And this keeps the background radiation within the chamber within low minimum detectable activities. But the question remains, okay, so you need 30 centimeters of steel, but why couldn't you just build your radiation shield out of any old steel? Like if regular steel is good enough for your car and your appliances and your skyscrapers, why would you have to harvest the flesh of a decommissioned battleship in order to build this thick radiation shield? Yeah, again, it's it's easy to sort of leap to magical conclusions. It's kind of like, well, we live in a... We live in a, 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 a sinful world. We have to build <laughs> our sacred vessel out of wood from the Garden of Eden. You know, um, you know, the, the atomic age has so scarred our world that we have to we have to find artifacts from before that time. Yeah, it certainly does feel like that. But no, there is actually a very good physical scientific reason for this. And maybe we should take a break and then get back into it when we come back. All right, we're back. So we've been talking about the idea of a radiation shielding around a very sensitive radiation detector room, and the shielding was made out of steel that was harvested from a decommissioned World War II battleship called the USS Indiana. So the question is, why would you need to get steel from a source like that? Why couldn't you just use regular steel? Well, uh, so let's look at how you make steel. Steel is, of course, a mixture of iron and carbon and sometimes other additives to create alloys with special properties. And crucially for our purposes, the process for making steel involves the incorporation of atmospheric gases. I was reading about this in an article for Chemistry World by Kit Chapman. I think it was also a podcast episode of theirs, uh, talking about how there, there are two major industrial processes for making steel in the modern world. One is known as the Bessemer process, and this involves melting the iron in a furnace and then removing impurities by blowing air through the molten metal. The other is known as the BOS process, and this is similar, but it uses pure oxygen instead of air. But that oxygen is still extracted from the atmosphere. And so the problem mm. is that either way, the gas you're blowing through the molten iron to make your steel comes from the atmosphere, from the air. And ever since nuclear weapon tests began in 1945, that has not exactly been regular air. 
It is bomb air. Yeah, the, the the ghastly truth of it is, yeah, we we find ourselves saying, oh, we need to use uh, air in this. It's like, oh, the the air, the air we breathe. That's where we set off um, a whole lot of nuclear weapons, um, and uh, and therefore changed it. Um, uh, that air is not good enough for our steel, for for yeah. the special steel at least, just for our, our breathing and uh, our our food and uh, our our children and so forth. Now we'll get a bit more into the history of the nuclear testing era in a second here, but in short. There was a period of time in the middle of the 20th century when lots of nuclear weapons tests were conducted around the world, and these tests seeded the atmosphere with radioactive contamination. Now, the levels today are much lower than they were, say, in the mid-1960s when these tests had been going on for a decade and a half. But even today, the air still contains some radioactive isotopes, such as cobalt-60 and others, uh, that is left over from the hundreds of nuclear detonations that characterized the post-war period. Now, this had many effects, of course, the most important of which are probably like the health effects on humans and the effects on wildlife. But another one of the effects is that for a long time, you couldn't make steel via normal processes without it being potentially contaminated with radioactive particles. Not so many radioactive particles that it would be unsafe for regular use, but enough that it would be unsuitable if you were trying to make a sensitive instrument. So if you needed to make a Geiger counter or shielding for a sensitive radiobioassay chamber. Uh, so what would you do? Well, it, it probably wasn't impossible to make steel without environmental contaminants from nuclear tests, but... It would have been expensive and difficult, and another option presented itself, which was harvesting steel made before the Trinity test in 1945. And this precious material became known in the industry as low background steel, low background because of its low background radiation. And what would be a great source of huge quantities of pre-bomb steel? Old naval vessels. Mm. So to come back to the Timothy Lynch article about the radiobioassay facility in Richland, uh, the USS Indiana was, again, the battleship that was sourced, it was the source here. It was decommissioned on September 11th, 1947, and then sold for scrap after it was taken off the Navy list in uh, June 1st, 1962. And as the ship was dismantled, some parts were kept for ceremonial purposes, like the main mast and a 40 millimeter gun were put on display on the campus of Indiana University Bloomington. And I know some of its anchors were put on display at various museums and memorials, you know, its compasses, wheels and all that went to places where where you can honor the fallen ships. Wow, it, it this really drives home this metaphor of the the, the ship is a fallen beast. Like the yeah. warship is a thing that once dead, uh, you know, that certain parts are kept for, like you said, ceremonial purposes or mm -hmm. you know, display purposes, magical purposes, and yet other things are harvested for sort of for the the raw meat or bone of the the creature. Right, and the raw meat or bone would be the steel here. This made up the bulk of the ship was put to low background uses. So an Indiana VA hospital got 65 tons of low background steel from the Indiana, and that was used for their own, uh, their own background radiation counting facilities. But then Lynch writes, quote, In addition to the VA hospital facility, several large sections of the hull, weighing a total of 210 tons, were also fabricated into a room. These applications were probably never imagined by the original designers of the Indiana. These sections of the hull are still being used for the original purpose as a shield— but instead of protecting against artillery shells and torpedoes, the new purpose is to shield radiation detectors from the background radiations originating from cosmic, atmospheric, man-made, and terrestrial sources. So what was once armor against munitions is now armor against the entire universe and its radioactive contents. <laughs> Uh, the room was first constructed at the University of Utah Medical Center in Salt Lake City, where it was used for many years in radiobiology research, and then it was finally moved to the Richland facility in 1988. And the Indiana was not the only battleship that became a source of low background steel. Uh, so after the armistice in 1918 at the conclusion of World War I, the German high seas fleet was ordered to report to an allied base known as the Scapa Flow, 
where the naval vessels were supposed to be handed over to the British Royal Navy. But the German officers did not like that. They had a different idea, and they decided sort of as a kind of last middle finger to the British, they scuttled their ships in the harbor. They sank their own ships on purpose so that the British couldn't have them. So now there are all those shipwrecks there. In fact, the, the Scapa Flow is well known for its World War I era shipwrecks uh, and has been exploited extensively as a source of low background steel. And though it's not known for sure, I've read rumors, unconfirmed rumors, that some early spacecraft may have used low background steel from the Scapa Flow or other wrecks in radiation detectors. Hmm, Interesting. Now, I mentioned this earlier, but it's worth pointing out again that the atmosphere is much less radioactive today than it was at the height of nuclear testing in, in the middle of the century. Uh, for example, Cobalt-60 has a half-life of about 5.3 years, and there has been a lot less nuclear testing since the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty in 1963, certainly a, a lot less uh, atmospheric testing. So the atmosphere should be reduced to um, near pre-war levels of background contamination within a reasonable amount of time, but but it took decades. So, Robert, when reading about this, I came across a comic strip I thought you might like. It's uh, one of the XKCD comics, and in it, they build a time machine, but it turns out the time machine requires lead from sunken Roman warships, and uh, <laughs> this is, of course, hard to come by, so they determine they have enough lead for one trip into the past, and uh, and in this way, through time travel, Greek fire is born. It's kind of like the the you know if you could you only had one wish from a genie, what do you do? Well, you wish for more wishes. Yeah, more wishes. Uh, yeah, I yeah, I love this little comic strip. Uh, I had not seen it before you uh, shared it with me, but it uh, it it's especially nice because I just started watching some '90s episodes of The Outer Limits, oh. and this is the kind of sort of outer limitsy sort of plot, maybe skewed a little bit for. Uh, comedic purposes, but you know it's the it's the kind of twist you uh, you expect in time travel fiction. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so if I wasn't totally clear and you didn't get it, they they travel back in time and use their future weapons on Roman warships, yes. and of course that becomes yeah. the legend of Greek fire. Yeah, they take out like a helicopter with a flamethrower yeah. back in time and uh, and and set to light the Roman ships. Now, I guess we've made several references to this nuclear testing age in the middle of the 20th century. Of course, this began in the 1940s. The first one was, again, the Trinity test by the United States in July 1945. Uh, the Soviet Union first performed nuclear weapons tests in 1949. Tests took place all, you know, all over the place. They were in the upper atmosphere, underground, in the ocean. And once several other uh, – the, the majority of the tests were by the United States and the Soviet Union, but several other countries eventually got involved, and there were a lot of bomb tests in the end. Yes. So you're probably wondering, well, just how many? So I, I looked, at, looked around for a good uh... – Good, good total on this. And I find that the, the estimates vary a little bit. I mean, not a lot, but mm -hmm. uh, according to Daryl Kimball, uh, executive director of the Arms Control Association, which is a great source for, for this sort of uh, uh, information, this is what they had to say in a July 2020 report. Quote, since the first nuclear test explosion on July 16, 1945, at least eight nations have detonated 2,056 nuclear test explosions at dozens of test sites, including Lopnor in China, the atolls of the Pacific, Nevada, Algeria, where France conducted its first nuclear device, Western Australia, where the UK exploded nuclear weapons, the South Atlantic, Semipalatinsk in uh, Kazakhstan, across Russia and elsewhere. So that's over 2,000 nuclear test explosions in total. And if you're looking specifically at atmospheric tests alone, which are often considered like the worst kind in, in terms of proliferating uh, uh, contaminants into the atmosphere, of course, those would be there, there were definitely more than 500 atmospheric tests. Yeah, when you when you start breaking down the numbers, the U.S. conducted most of these with uh, let's see, some 215 atmospheric tests and 815 underground tests. The USSR slash Russia ranks second with 219 atmospheric tests and 496 underground tests, and the remaining ranking uh, goes like this: you got France, then the U.K. and China. They're tied, uh, U.K. and China, with a total of 45 tests each. Then you have North Korea, India, and Pakistan. Uh, the United States is, of course, responsible for the only wartime detonation of nuclear weapons, as in utilized as weapons against uh, another people. Two bombs deployed against. The 
the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, killing between 129,000 and 226,000 people, mostly civilians. Needless to say, those were both atmospheric detonations. Yeah. And of course, with each of these tests, there is going to be more radioactive contamination entering the atmosphere. Now, in 1963, the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty managed to ban tests in the atmosphere and underwater. So basically, it banned all except underground tests. It did not really stop nuclear proliferation, but it did massively decrease the dispersal of radionuclides into the atmosphere. Now, there's been another um, perhaps unexpected interesting environmental side effect of the nuclear testing age, which is how it has affected atmospheric levels of carbon-14 and the way that this has turned into an unexpected number of scientific tools that can be used to study the natural world. So in nature, uh, carbon-14 is a radioactive isotope of carbon that is generated in Earth's atmosphere. Every minute of every day, the Earth is, of course, bombarded by cosmic rays, and cosmic rays are charged particles, usually protons and atomic nuclei, which are emitted from high-energy sources, including the sun, but also places far away, usually traveling near the speed of light. And when one of these high-energy particles enters the atmosphere, it sometimes strikes atoms to generate free neutrons. And a free neutron then combines with a regular atom of nitrogen-14 to produce an atom of carbon-14. And this carbon-14 then pairs up with oxygen to create carbon-14-CO2. So there's a lot of carbon-14 in the atmosphere. It's just produced at a steady rate naturally as the cosmic rays are coming in. And this carbon-14-CO2 gets into everything that ingests atmospheric carbon. So plants suck in CO2 with a predictable amount of carbon-14, and they use that carbon to make their bodies. And then the trees and the grass and the corn are all made out of carbon content that is retrieved from the air and has a certain amount of carbon-14 in it. So if you do a molecular analysis of a plant, you will have a certain proportion of carbon-14 in there because the atmosphere does. About one out of every trillion carbon atoms is a carbon-14 atom. But of course, it doesn't stop at plants because we also exist in a carbon-14 generating atmosphere. You know, all the chemistry on Earth is sort of interconnected. So we eat those plants and we eat animals that eat those plants. So our bodies also have a predictable amount of carbon-14 content. And as I said earlier, carbon-14 is radioactive, which is another way of saying it's unstable. It has a known half-life, so we know that it decays into other isotopes at a regular, predictable rate. So if you die and you stop breathing and stop eating, the amount of carbon-14 in your body will steadily decrease over the years. And what scientists figured out in the 20th century was that you could use the amount of carbon-14 in a formerly living object or an object formerly incorporating a, a known percentage of atmospheric carbon to see approximately how long it had been since that organism stopped ingesting carbon from the environment. In other words, when it died. And this has been amazingly useful to the historical sciences. This, this has created the era of carbon-14 dating. Uh, it's been enormously useful to archaeologists and all kinds of other scientists to analyze and date organisms and substances from the past. But nuclear testing, beginning in the 1940s and especially since the 1950s, has introduced new wrinkles into this. It has introduced new layers of radiocarbon science, both some complications to the existing radiocarbon science and new tools that scientists couldn't have predicted at first that they would have. Uh, and so next, I just wanted to talk a bit about a really, really excellent article in The Atlantic by uh, by Carl Zimmer. Can we say friend of the show, Carl Zimmer? He's a former guest of the show, Carl Zimmer. Um, well, let's see. We ha we laid out specific rules for this in the past, right? Uh, <laughs> if you're on the show once, you're a, a, a former guest or a previous guest of the show. Okay. I think you have to be on two times to be a friend of the show, or is it three times? I can't remember how that status uh, is, is declared. No, we break, we bend the rules all the time. Uh, Car Carl's one of my favorite science writers. Uh, he, he he wrote an excellent book called She Has Her Mother's Laugh that we talked about on the show. And, and this article is just fantastic, but it's called Nuclear Tests Marked Life on Earth with a Radioactive Spike. And this article, of course, is worth reading on its own, but I wanted to talk about a few things 
things that Carl gets into here uh, about some of the environmental effects of, of nuclear testing, specifically relating to carbon-14. So Carl, Carl Zimmer, in addition to having been a, a, a wonderful and just cheerful guest of the show, uh, is just all, a wonderful writer, as always. Uh, I want to read just a little bit from this article here to, to set the stage. Quote, Carbon-14 produced by hydrogen bombs spread over the entire world. It worked itself into the atmosphere, the oceans, and practically every living thing. As it spread, it exposed secrets. It can reveal when we were born. It tracks hidden changes to our hearts and brains. It lights up the cryptic channels that join the entire biosphere into a single network of chemical flux. This man-made burst of carbon-14 has been such a revelation that scientists refer to it as, quote, the bomb spike. Only now is the bomb spike close to disappearing. But as it vanishes, scientists have found a new use for it to track global warming, the next self-inflicted threat to our survival. The part of this that sticks with me the most is where he talks about how looking at carbon-14 and the way it penetrates the whole biosphere, really it's one of those, you know, like the brain lights up with the sudden realization that uh, to use a, a sort of a stoner cliche, everything's connected. But it it really is. It like literally in a scientific way is. There is a single sort of chemical flux that that takes place all throughout this planet. Yeah, I, I keep coming back to this this basic like this this uh, this sort of uh, you know arguably hippie notion this everything's connected we're all one world one people etc which I know is something that everyone has heard so many times that even if you believe in it wholeheartedly it can it can sound a little uh, 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 limp uh, you know in in your ears mm. and yet like that's I mean that is the reality that drives through in all of this science and it stands in such harsh contrast to the way uh, certain individuals uh, in uh, like the political and the military sphere view uh, nuclear weapons. The idea that like, you know, certainly we can say a head of state using a nuclear weapon against a city within their own nation. That would be that would be ridiculous. That would be monstrous. Uh, but it's <laughs> but but then, the, uh, you know, people will say, oh, but do you use it against a, a, another nation and other people? Oh, that's less monstrous. But no, no, it's all interconnected in a, in, a, in, in a in a scientifically verifiable way. I mean, it's it's one atmosphere <laughs> at, at the very base level without getting into um, uh, some of the other um, issues we're going to explore and just the basic uh, ethical framework of the choice. Yeah, I mean, it makes me think of that commonly cited thing uh, about astronauts very often, you know, seeing the Earth from space and then suddenly feeling more of a kinship with all of humankind and not feeling nearly as much the, uh, the, the not feeling the reality of national borders mm -hmm. and things like that uh, nearly as much anymore. Uh, it's funny how easily those illusions can be dissolved just by a sort of a single visual impression or a single realization about, say, how chemistry works. Yeah. That you're suddenly like, oh, wait a minute, you know, there's just sort of earth life and we we really need to make this work and, and not create problems that aren't necessary to begin with. Yeah, those those lines on those maps, they really do nothing against uh, <laughs> radioactive particles and certainly uh, concepts such as nuclear fallout or uh, uh, or uh, climate change. So going into Carl Zimmer's article, as I said, uh, it's worth reading the article in full. It's really fantastic. Uh, he begins by telling the story of the Castle Bravo test in 1954, which is uh, 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 both awe-inspiring and horrifying and heartbreaking. Um, but uh, later on, when he's getting into the scientific uh, history of, of carbon-14, he talks about the Chicago physicist Willard Libby, who is a Nobel Prize winning uh, – or uh, did I say physicist? I think he would be called a physical chemist. Uh, he was somebody who studied radioactive elements and, and one of, was one of the major developers of carbon-14 dating. And one of the really interesting things that Libby does is that Libby ends up comparing measurements of methane from, say, living current sources, say methane coming off of a sewage plant. So this is going to be sewage from things that are currently alive versus methane coming off of fossil fuels like oil that has been there for millions of years. And what he showed was that, say, the methane coming off of the, the, the excreta produced by living humans is something close to about the atmospheric level. 
Meanwhile, what's coming, the methane coming off of uh, fossil fuels coming off of say oil that's been there for millions of years has essentially no carbon 14 in it, right? Because it's been there for so long that all of the radioactive isotopes of carbon have decayed. So it's just got regular carbon in it. And there were some other really interesting uh, experiments too. But uh, one of the things I wanted to focus on was uh, uh, Carl's profiling of the New Zealand physicist, uh, Ethel Rafter. So Rafter was picking up on Libby's research, and he was interested in radiocarbon dating in its early days. He used it to test the bones of extinct birds and ancient volcanic eruptions. But he also tried to help refine the technique itself by performing measurements of the radiocarbon in the atmosphere. And he would do this by setting out a tray of lye on top of a on a hilltop. And the lye would capture CO2 from the air, and then he would measure the atmospheric levels of carbon-14, or the ratio, of course. Whenever we're talking about levels of carbon-14, we're talking about the ratio of carbon-14 to regular carbon. And so Rafter would have been doing his research in the 1950s, and what he expected was that levels of radiocarbon in the atmosphere would sort of bounce up and down. There'd just be sort of a natural fluctuation around a baseline. But instead, he found an extremely steady trend— the level of carbon-14 was just continually going up. And what was the reason? Well, it was the 1950s. So uh, to quote from uh, the article, the Castle Bravo test and the ones that followed had to be the source. They were turning the atmosphere upside down. Instead of cosmic rays falling from space, they were sending neutrons up to the sky, creating a huge new supply of radiocarbon. In 1957, Rafter published his results in the journal Science. The implications were immediately clear and astonishing. Man-made carbon-14 was spreading across the planet from test sites in the Pacific and the Arctic. It was even passing from the air into the oceans and trees. And when they checked, they found increasing levels of radiocarbon in everything, in tree rings in Texas, in snails in Holland, in the lungs of recently deceased people from New York, even in the blood of living people. Uh, there's just extra carbon-14 in everything. And as bomb radiocarbon – so the bomb radiocarbon would be, uh, would be up in the uh, upper atmosphere – and as it settles back down to Earth, it becomes a sort of tracer molecule that can be used as a scientific tool. So uh, Carl quotes uh, from somebody named Steve Beaupre, who's an oceanographer at Stony Brook University. And he, he's quoted in the article saying that carbon-14 is inextricably linked to our understanding of how water moves. And so I thought this was so interesting. So in the 1970s, oceanographers found that there was bomb radiocarbon that was distributed throughout the top 1,000 meters of the ocean's water column. So if you go down 1,000 meters, you're going to find you know atmospheric radiocarbon, the elevated levels that you'd get from a bomb. But then if you go down below that, suddenly not so much anymore. And this became a really important piece of evidence in estimating the, or, or in establishing that the ocean, like the atmosphere, had layers and that water was primarily circulated within rather than between these layers. Uh, Carl writes, quote, the warm, relatively fresh water on the surface of the ocean glides over the cold, salty depths. These surface currents become saltier as they evaporate. And eventually, at a few crucial spots on the planet, these streams get so dense that they fall to the bottom of the ocean. The bomb radiocarbon from Castle Bravo didn't start plunging down into the depths of the North Atlantic until the 1980s, when John Clark, this character from the Castle Bravo test, was two decades into retirement. It's still down there, where it will be carried along the seafloor by bottom-hugging ocean currents for hundreds of years before it rises to the light of day. Uh, and he p points out also that lots of ocean life bears the seal of the bomb spike. Again, this is from atmospheric tests. It, so this is not even underwater tests. This is atmospheric tests coming down into the ocean. Bomb radiocarbon falls into the ocean. It infiltrates everything from algae to the rings of uh, calcium carbonate within coral growth. 
And then it forms this kind of slime. So, uh, <laughs> quote, the living things in the upper reaches of the ocean release organic carbon that falls gently to the seafloor, a jumble of protoplasmic goo, dolphin droppings, starfish eggs, and all manner of detritus that scientists call marine snow. In recent decades, that marine snow has become more radioactive. In the article, he also profiles a researcher named Mary Gaylord, who works at the National Ocean Sciences Accelerator Mass Spectrometry Facility, which is known as NOSAMS for short. And that's at the Woods Hole, which is where Hooper comes from in Jaws. Oh, huh. And she measures uh, radiocarbon and everything from bat guano to fish eyes. There's a lot about fish eyes in this article, which is more interesting than you'd think, uh, because surprisingly, the, the, the study of radiocarbon in fish eye lenses can tell us a lot. Like the cores of fish eye lenses have the same levels of carbon-14 as the fish did when they were still egg. So it's a really good age indicator. And this knowledge was used by Danish researchers in 2016 to create an aging metric for these uh, cold, bottom-dwelling animals, the Greenland sharks, which you might have read about them because they grow so old. This helped confirm the discovery that these animals could live to be almost 400 years old. So a lot of these are pre-bomb sharks. And actually, this also applies to humans. Uh, people born in the early 1960s have more radiocarbon in the lenses in their eyes than people born before the nuclear testing age. And people born in the years since then have less and less as time passes since the, uh, since the partial test ban treaty. Bomb radiocarbon can also be used to date human teeth. But there's a very sobering fact that's discussed at the end of Zimmer's article, which is that the proportion of carbon-14 currently in the atmosphere is actually a bit lower than would be predicted by the known nuclear tests and the known rate of decay and absorption by the earth and seas. So what makes the difference? Like, why is there less carbon 14 than we think there should be? And it turns out there's an answer to that. The answer is fossil fuels. Remember how I mentioned earlier that the methane coming off of oil had all, basically no carbon-14 in it because the oil is so old, all of the carbon-14 has already decayed. It's gone. Uh, so as we release carbon from these ancient carbon sources into the atmosphere, we're putting a much higher percentage than normal of regular carbon up there, which actually dilutes what carbon-14 there is. Uh, uh, Carl, Carl Zimmer points out that in 1954, which was the year of the Castle Bravo test, humans emitted 6 billion tons of carbon dioxide that year. Uh, quote, in 2018, humans emitted about 37 billion tons, uh, which is more than six times more. Uh, as Willard Libby first discovered, this fossil fuel has no radiocarbon left. By burning it, we are lowering the level of radiocarbon in the atmosphere like a bartender watering down the top shelf liquor. Which is so strange. So the, the remaining signature of humanity's first great sort of civilization level threat technology is being diluted by the ever increasing mark of our other one by the second one. Wow. All right. I guess we need to take a quick break, but we'll be right back with more. So I have another example of a specific resulting scientific discovery from a nuclear test that, that I ran across. Um, and it, uh, it concerns uh, the, uh, uh, the test known as Starfish Prime. So this was a 1.4 megaton thermonuclear device launched 250 miles or 400 kilometers into the sky near Johnston Atoll. So it is the largest outer space nuclear detonation ever committed. It occurred around 11 p.m. local time. Uh, this would be um, uh, in, uh, you know, in, the, in that region. And the thermonuclear sphere burned like a new sun in the night sky. And if you look up Starfish Prime online, you can, you can see photos that were taken from Honolulu, Hawaii at the time. And it does look like, like a sun in the sky. Wow. Afterwards, an aura could be seen uh, as well for thousands of kilometers. It, uh, it also resulted in, and this kind of comes down to one of the key findings, it uh, resulted in an electromagnetic pulse or an EMP, something that had been suspected by scientists, but this was really the, the proof in the pudding. It ended up disrupting the flow of electricity for hundreds of uh, kilometers around it, uh, with its ma most of its disruptions felt uh, in, in Hawaii itself. It also damaged six satellites, which ultimately failed, and other failures might 
might be linked to Starfish Prime as well. So this was this was ended up being an effect that was far stronger than anticipated. Now, now uh, that, that's all interesting, but obviously a test like this expand is going to expand on our understanding of the weapon technology being tested. But the side effect here is that the CD109 tracers released by the detonation allowed scientists to work out some of the seasonal uh, mixing rate of polar and tropical air masses. So again, it comes down to the fluid dynamics of, uh, of in, in our earlier example, uh, the ocean and here with atmospheric uh, movement. This also touches on something that comes up with the Castle Bravo test and a number of other tests. You know, the Castle Bravo being the hydrogen bomb that turned out to be a much bigger explosive yield than was predicted. And this is not just a, a scientific curiosity. I mean, this is something that, that had tragic consequences for real people like uh, the, the people of the Rongelap Atoll who were pretty nearby where the Castle Bravo test uh, was conducted were, were affected horribly with uh, by like fallout from the test just because it was so much bigger than the scientists thought it was going to be. Yeah, you you see this this trend with a number of the the earlier tests um, where they yeah, they don't get quite what they were expecting, or you know it's larger, or it doesn't go off exactly the, the way it was planned. And and, and indeed, uh, in, in many cases, it means people were were, were sickened, uh, people's health suffered because of these tests. Environments were um, were tainted by the radiation, are still tainted. In some cases, cases people have been uh, dislocated and have not yet been able to return. Um, you know, we I believe we're calling this episode the atomic scar. But a scar, we tend to think of as something that is visible but is fully healed. And the thing about a lot of these uh, these tests is is that it's it's not so much a scar, but it is like um, a, a thick scab. And if we are to to pick at it again, uh, we may bleed. In fact, we may we may bleed um, uh, for the duration of our lives, uh, sort of situation. So. Um, uh, so, so yeah, the, these uh, it kind of comes back to what we said earlier about you know where, about the, the the world in which we conduct these tests. You know, we we might think, oh, we're not setting this off in the house; we're setting it off in the backyard. You know, but but ultimately, you know, the the wilds of Nevada or uh, you know, some islands, uh, you know, off the coast of Australia. These are these are part of the world we live in, and it's part of the atmosphere that we all breathe, part of the ocean that we all depend on. And even underground tests are not without some environmental consequences. I mean, not nearly as much as, say, an atmospheric or underwater test, but underground mm-hmm. tests, too, can can produce leakages. Yeah. Now, on the subject of underwater tests, I was uh, reading a little bit more about these. And um, the, these were banned by the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty in 1963. But the U.S., the U.K., and the USSR managed to conduct a, a total of nine uh, before that, uh, that, that ban p- uh, came into place. And these included um, shallow detonations to see how the, uh, the, the, the weapon would impact ships, as well as deep detonations to see how they might be used against submarines or how they would impact submarines. The deepest was the 1955 uh, Wigwam test at a depth of 2,000 feet, 610 meters. Now, an author by the name of Sarah Laskow wrote a, a really good article about, uh, about the U.S. tests for Atlas Obscura, pointing out that the water is what really made the, the tests more problematic. Because instead of spreading radioactive particles through a wider atmospheric region, it instead released a, an immediate radioactive water cloud. Ugh. So the ships used in these tests were highly radiated and impossible to clean. So they were just towed out to to the deep and and scuttled. Uh, Now, Laskow writes that, quote, the Atomic Energy Commission would not sign off on it until it was clear that no one in the United States or Mexico was at risk and that the test area was relatively free of marine life. Um, But uh, but the test certainly killed fish and other organisms. Um, I read an account by a, a U.K. veteran who uh, was, of course, working with some of those UK uh, uh, t- uh, tests, claims that men were sent out in boats to collect dead, irradiated fish after, uh, after the test was uh, conducted. And this particular test would have been uh, the 1952 hurricane test in the Montebello Islands, as this was the only UK underwater uh, nuclear test that was conducted. And of course, in a lot of these uh, like uh, tests in the Pacific Islands and stuff, even when the explosion was carried out in the atmosphere, it was still extremely damaging to marine life. Like, yeah. uh, there's a part in uh, Carl Zimmer's article that we were talking about earlier where he he talks about with the Castle Bravo test in '54. Quote, within seconds, the fireball had lofted 10 million tons of pulverized coral reef coated in radioactive material. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, these uh, these atmospheric tests were also devastating to these areas. Uh, one area that frequently comes up is um, is Bikini Atoll. Uh, this is where the first underwater test was uh, was uh, uh, was conducted, uh, Baker. Uh, but also, you had many other atmospheric tests that took place uh, there as well. And what's interesting here is that there have been a, there's some studies in, in over the, the past decade or so that have, have really looked at how the local environment has has bounced back. And in, indeed, it, it does show that nature uh, can be very resistant to even this kind of, uh, you know, intense uh, damage. Uh, the, they say that uh, corals have recolonized bomb craters. Uh, other life forms are doing well, uh, even if there are some curious mutations like sharks missing their second dorsal fin, that sort of thing. The, the general belief is that, um, at least with, uh, with bikini, that the worst affected fish died off decades ago, and today's fish populations are only exposed to low radiation levels as they frequently swim in and out. Uh, plus, these are also areas that have been left alone by humans, They've uh, uh, more so than other um, marine areas. Now, one should also note that the occupants of the area around Bikini Atoll and the, the Marshall Islands were displaced by the test, some 167 people, I believe, and they've never been able to return. Uh, they, their dislocation was supposed to be temporary, um, but, uh, but then on top of that, children in the Marshall Islands uh, uh, were, were uh, observed to experience uh, thyroid problems long after nuclear tests ended. Mm-hmm. Now, we've thus far been talking about n- nuclear testing, and... And of course, beyond that, we, we, I think we can, we can hardly talk about nuclear testing without at least briefly discussing the prospect of nuclear war itself, because that is ultimately what the testing is all about. Now, you can make the argument that ultimately it's about preventing uh, that sort of um, warfare from taking place by making sure you have uh, you know, a terrifying number of, uh, of, uh, of nuclear weapons in your armament or, uh, you know, the reverse is true, that you are developing these weapons which may potentially be used. Any uh, nuclear weapon is a potential uh, holocaust, uh, you know, contained within the, uh, the warhead. Right. I mean, I think I guess the advocates of the the pro nuclear armament theory would say, well, what we did is that we did these tests so that we wouldn't have to have actual wars, and the tests discouraged, say, the United States and the Soviet Union from actually ever initiating a real, you know, shooting war with each other. Though, of course, there were plenty of proxy conflicts and all that. Uh, I mean. Y- in a way, you can only you, you know you can never know how sure to be about counterfactuals like that. People are yeah. saying, well, things would have been worse if we hadn't had the nuclear threat looming over us to discourage us from going to war. Uh, I, I guess it's hard to know whether that's true or not. But I guess it's also though it's just hard to calculate costs and benefits when you're thinking about when you know the potential cost is like a civilization-ending worldwide calamity. Yeah, and and that indeed. You know, to come back to the the idea of the world changing forever, I mean, that is one of the frequently uh, touched upon aspects of the whole scenario is that it is humanity's ability to to truly destroy itself in, uh, and ultimately within a very short uh, period of time. Now, I know that this kind of brings us to a uh, kind of a dark corner for the end of the podcast. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I know a lot of you don't like considering such possibilities. I don't like considering such possibilities either. Uh, If you uh, are, are troubled by such uh, possibilities, uh, I would urge you to consider following uh, so a group like the Arms Control Association at armscontrol.org or n- any number of other anti-nuclear weapon or uh, nuclear weapon control or disarmament groups. And if you're in a position to use your vote to favor candidates, political candidates who take nuclear testing and nuclear war seriously and are committed to certainly not testing them, but even, you know, not even raising the question of their deployment or questioning why they shouldn't be used and that sort of thing, uh, then you should you should do so. Yeah, I mean, the Cold War may be over, but there are still lots and lots of nuclear weapons out there. And uh, and fantasizing about nuclear escalation is, is not a joke. It's not it's not something to play around with. Absolutely, especially since I, I think we've touched on some of this on the show before. Like the 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 uh, the barriers between our 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 current world and one of nuclear warfare, those those barriers are not as thick as as sometimes we might think they are. Like uh, the the safeguards in place are are not that robust. Uh, we we need to do everything we can to. To, to 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 lessen the possibility uh, that such a thing could come to pass, either in a, in a large scale, certainly, but even at a quote unquote small scale. 
All right, on that note, we're going to go ahead and close it out. Uh, in the meantime, we'd, of course, love to hear from you, uh, your thoughts about uh, nuclear testing, nuclear weaponry, et cetera, or just sort of the overall impact on all of this, uh, on, on our, our world and our culture, uh, the many ways that the world uh, would not be the same. In the meantime, if you want to check out other episodes of our show, you can do so by finding us wherever you get your podcast and wherever that happens to be. We just ask that you rate, review, and subscribe. Huge thanks, as always, to our excellent audio producer, Seth Nicholas Johnson. If you would like to get in touch with us with feedback on this episode or any other, to suggest a topic for the future, or just to say hello, you can email us at contact at stufftoblowyourmind.com. Stuff to Blow Your Mind is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app. Apple Podcasts are wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 